Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Valeria. As Valeria said, my name is David Fawkes. I'm uh, working at the physics department at the University of Surrey. And uh, this presentation is about the science of the three tower model. This is a, a model that's been under development for about 10 years now, and it's been funded by a succession of large European Marie Curie style grants, the latest of which is called ERICA and which uh, concludes uh, at the early part of next year. Now, um, ERICA is concerned with understanding cementitious materials. Uh, cement is the second most consumed material on planet Earth. The first is water and cement and cement production is the third largest contributor to global CO2. Um, so it is of, uh, it's of huge interest. Um, and uh, much of this work has emanated from that. Um, and has funded most of this work. I would also like to acknowledge and thank profusely uh, an, an academic gift by P&G, Procter & Gamble USA, um, which has also um, uh, prompted me to do uh, um, certain uh, work in this area. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful to Procter & Gamble for their support. It demonstrates that, that this work is of, of great relevance to those out in industry. Um, across the sector. Um, it's okay to have a great model, um, but it's no good at all if you, uh, the user community, can't actually use it. And the reason for next week's webinar is because we now have some software available, some really nice software with a good interface that allows you, the user community, um, to, for free, uh, use the three tower model and to assess if it's, you know, any good for the particular systems that you're looking at. So that will be next week. Um, today we're going to um, look at the science of the three tower model, but I'm also going to talk about um, plans for the future and about how we can extend this model to a wider range of systems that I hope will be of interest to a, a broader number of you. Okay, so the content of this talk is as follows. First of all, I'm going to explain what the three tower model actually is. And uh, initially, I'm going to describe two model variants that will be the subject of next week's webinar, and which is available as open source software. These are labelled HH and HM, and I will explain what that means um, in due course. Um, but I particularly want to look at two new variants, which can easily be extended from the uh, present work, um, but for which we don't yet have an interface, and for what we would need to have funding for in order to um, produce interface. There's uh, an Erica graduated PhD student called Remy Kogan, who is responsible for the preparation of this, uh, this interface. And um, he's been absolutely critical to, to the work that's being presented today and next week. So I talk about the science of the model and its fit parameters. It's a model that fits to relaxation rate dispersion curves. And in particular, at the end, I want to focus on what are called offset parameters. This is the sort of background relaxation rate that one sees when one attempts to fit to the dispersion curves. We see that there's always an, an offset associated with some kind of physical process, which we'll, we'll discuss. OK, so what is the three tower model? Um, well, it's a model that uh, generates um, the relaxation rate dispersion curve um, over the full frequency range for a good range, but certainly not all systems, with solid liquid interfaces. 
and there's a schematic on the left of our solid and our liquid uh, system. So in the model, the liquid must contain protons. So we will generally assume that the liquid is water, but it need not be. The solid either contains paramagnetic ions or it doesn't contain paramagnetic ions. So you would think that that uh, involves all possible solids, but in fact, that's not the case, as we'll see a bit later. OK, I'm going to start uh, for illustration with one of the two model variants that you'll see put into action next week. This is the variant in which the solid material contains paramagnetic ions of some sort. And they are represented by these white crosses in the solid material at the bottom here. The red uh, wiggly curves are representative of interactions that are accommodated within this model variant. HN stands for H for the proton spin, which is on the water, and M stands for metal, which is a paramagnetic electronic spin. So these are the two interactions that are considered in this particular variant of the model. It is the dipolar interaction between the electronic paramagnetic spin and dipolar interaction in the bulk part of the water and the dipolar interaction with the water in the surface layer. So it's just those two interactions that are considered. And the relaxation rate is associated with the motion of the mobile spins relative to the fixed paramagnetic ions in the solid. But it's a nuisance, uh, frankly, mathematically at least, to have a distribution of paramagnetic ions within a solid. And we adopt the normal practice in the model of uh, introducing what we call an effective layer of paramagnetic ion density indicated by the white dashed line here as representative of all the um, paramagnetic ions in the solid. The second version, which is all, both of these are contained with that in the available software, is the system without paramagnetics. And this is labeled HH, H for proton spins, and here there are three interactions that are considered. So again, we're talking about modeling the relative motion of pairs of spins. But in the fluid, there are these two environments, bulk and surface layer, and we have to consider these pairs of interactions um, separately. So one of these, again, is the bulk, bulk interaction. The interaction between one bulk spin on a water molecule with that of a proton on another water molecule. The surface bulk interaction where one of the water molecules is in the so slow moving surface layer. And of course the surface surface interaction. We'll go back uh, to the HM model just to indicate to you which parameters are not uh, fit parameters, parameters that are hardwired into the three tower model, those that are immovable and fixed and you have no control over. The first of these is the thickness of the surface layer. That's called delta and it's equal to 0.27 nanometers and that is the thickness of a layer of water. But it doesn't matter whether you're using methanol or uh, another organic liquid, um, that thickness is always fixed at that 0.27 nanometers. That's our standard nanometric uh, length unit, if you like. The second fixed parameter is if the system has uh, paramagnetics in it, then the effective layer is fixed at two deltas below the surface, just as shown here. 
the fit parameters, uh, and there are five of them, are listed here in this table. So three of them are tau uh, parameters. So the three tau model comes from the three tau time constants, and the time constant describe the dynamics of the system. So two of these time constants are associated with the surface layer of the water. That's tau L, L for layer, tau D, D for desorption, and tau B is for the bulk uh, uh, fluid, which is uh, the bulk the associated bulk diffusion time constant. So we're going to look at those time constants in a little bit more detail in a moment. The two other parameters are, if there are paramagnetic ions in the solid, then there is a paramagnetic spin ion density associated with the effective layer, indicated by the dashed white line, as a fit parameter. And the fifth fit parameter I label X. X is simply the fraction of the water that is in the surface layer compared to all the fluid in your material. It's often called the surface to volume ratio, but it's a dimensions quantity. It's the fraction of the water in the surface layer. Now, so what sort of systems are accessible to us? Well, we've done a lot of work over the years on a wide range of systems. These are generally porous material with solid, solid, um, with or without paramagnetic uh, iron. So um, obviously cementitious material is of interest to us, but there's a wide range of, uh, of silicas, rocks like clay and so forth, um, limestone, um, these sorts of materials are accessible uh, to, um, to this analysis, plasters, etc, etc. Okay, and there's also soft solids. And we've just started moving into some systems, um, and particular cheese, um, which we consider a soft solid, and we weren't sure whether these are accessible to the three tower models. And it, and it does seem to be um, accessible, and it's looking pretty promising. But um, we're, we're making a little request for some, some help here. Um, we've done some work on mozzarella, which I think we agree is a soft solid and uh, a very nice product. Um, and uh, Stella very kindly sent through some other cheese related uh, uh, papers, um, which are very interesting. Um, so we're engaged in trying to, to, to model the cheese dispersion curve. It would be really useful to us, uh, this is myself and Remy Kogon, um, if, uh, if we have more cheese data to analyze. So if anyone's got some spare <laughs> cheese dispersion curves that they're prepared to send through, please do. It'll help us, uh, help us with the interpretation of, of these systems. But um, we're confident now that there's a wider variety of, of systems that is accessible to the three tower model, not just the regular sort of hard, porous materials. But there are other materials where the liquid dominates over the solid. So you've got solid in liquid rather than liquid in solid, if you understand me. So solid suspensions and slurries are certainly accessible to the three tower model. And indeed, of course, creams and pastes, which are very similar. So all these sort of classes of systems are accessible to the three tower model at present. Now I'm going to uh, want to discuss uh, two systems that are I'm describing as nearly accessible. Um, the first of these I've loosely called biological systems. And this is the area we want to move into. Um, it will broaden the applications of the three tower model and also um, be useful to a wider range of, 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 of people in the sector. So I said earlier that um, the solid can either contain paramagnetic ions or it doesn't. There's a, th a third case where the solid contains proton spins. And a relatively straightforward adaptation of what we have already 
would cater for this particular type of uh, system class. So for example, lipid systems is one possibility um, as an application here. Hydrogels, potentially. Uh, body, why well, put body parts? I'm not sure. Body parts, um, and if any of you are interested in body parts, I'm thinking medical applications here. And uh, I've seen a, a dispersion curve of cartilage um, in an article, I think, by Siegfried Stapp. Uh, that looks eminently accessible using the three tower model. So me some medical applications. Foodstuffs, most certainly, certain foodstuffs and polymer systems and so forth. OK, so um, I want you to think if any of these systems are in your sort of remit and whether you would be interested in um, the th using the three tower model in the future to analyse such systems. The other class of system that we're interested in moving on to, for which we have the technology, but not the interface, not the software um, available to you, the user community, is the set of nano, truly nano sized systems, where the pores are truly nano sized, and by that I mean less than 10 nanometers. Now, when we were testing the three tower model, um, we were not getting different results um, if the uh, pore size was 10 nanometers or greater. In other words, 10 nanometers pore thickness is effectively infinity. And it doesn't matter if one goes beyond that, that, um, that distance. But as I'm sure you all know, as the confinement increases of the fluid, the pores get smaller, then it's well known that the relaxation rate gets um, very large. And that's because the relaxation rate is associated with the strength of the interaction, which is dependent on how close the pairs of spins are, and also how long they're there for. So if you've got a smaller size systems, the spins are very close, but they're also there for a long time. So you get very high rates. And whether or not the greater volume of water is contained in those nano sized pores, often it can dominate the relaxation rate. So the motivation for doing this originally was again, cementitious systems, because if you add water to cement, cement like products, water, um, plaster, so forth, it sets. And what's happening there is that the water contained in larger pores, often called capillary pores, um, by the process of setting the chemical reactions that are taking place, the water is drawn out of those and gel pores form. Now gel pores are pores typically three to five nanometers um, in dimension and that fall outside um, the three tower model in the sense only that there's not software available for the user community to access. Although we have done the calculations and we've got all the equations and we can generate the relaxation rates ourselves. Other systems of interest here are, are obviously catalysts. Now catalysts, you want to maximize the surface area. So often one's using silicas, aluminas perhaps, um, uh, with, with very fine uh, channels and, uh, and spaces that would be useful to, um, uh, to this type of nano version of the three tower model. Zeolites also, they're used in washing powders and also catalysts as well, I think, are uh, numerous types of structures with channels and networks of small spaces and even hydrocarbon systems such as mudstones, um, potentially. Anyway, you guys have got a better idea what might be appropriate than I have, um, but these are the directions we want to go with the model, but we can only do that if we get funding, which I'll come to in just a moment. So if we take the first of these, the bio version, this is the sort of system we're looking at. So there's five interactions here that we take into account, but the first three of these are all the same, as the HH model just seen. So we, we, we've got all that in place. 
if the solid contains proton spins indicated by the H's here, distributed in the solid, but represented again by an affected layer, then we add two more interactions, which is the uh, bulk solid spin-spin interaction and the surface solid spin-spin interaction. This is a very straightforward thing for us to do. What is less straightforward is producing the interface um, to enable you to access um, these systems. As far as nano is concerned, then we're interested in two types of pore shape, the planar pores and channel pores. And again, we've got the equations and the technology, but we don't have the interface. Um, there was a paper just a year or so ago that came out in which absolutely the dispersion curve from a silica material um, using not water, but various organics clearly demonstrated uh, through our calculations that um, uh, there were channel pores in which housed the liquid. And this was in a silica sample um, ranging from about as low as three nanometers uh, upwards. And the reference is below. Okay, but we can only do this if we get funding. And our plan over the next month is to make an application to the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council uh, as, uh, to support Remy Kogon as a postdoctoral researcher to continue his work with the interface and, and getting this model out there to you for your use. Our ambition is to do the following as part of that uh, grant application if it were to be successful. First of all, we would be able to support you in the use of the existing software that we'll demonstrate next week. And that in concerns the installation and, and advice in operating this, the software. Now, you know how it is when you download some software, it's not always easy to do. There's glitches and all sorts of things can happen. And then when you're trying to use it, you may need help and advice. And we want to provide that service to you as part of a successful grant application. We are also uh, keen to provide uh, what I call bespoke adaptations to the existing models. So you might have the open source software, you might be able to use it, but it doesn't quite do what you want to do. Or there's something a little bit extra you would like to do with it, an adaptation. And we would be very willing to uh, support you and to make the necessary ad adaptations if that, if that was feasible. So that's another way we want to, to outreach and help, help those of you who are trying to interpret your data. And the third is what I've just been talking about, the two new areas, the bio and nano model variants. Um, so that would involve me doing the calculations, to generate the data sets. Um, that's the easy part. Um, and uh, Remy preparing fresh um, interfaces for these two model variants. Now, we're only going to be successful in this grant application if we can convince the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council of the value of the work. That is that there's a, a need out there. So I'm, I'm making a request here that um, if you think what we're talking about here might be useful to you, and you won't know if it's going to be use, useful to you until you've tried it, if it might be useful to you, and you are willing to provide a letter of support, um, we would be extremely grateful. That would give us a chance. And the more letters of support, the better the chance we have. A letter of support is just a letter um, that explains who you are, uh, what your research is about, why your research is important, and um, a statement along the lines that um, this uh, particular aspect of what is proposed is of, uh, likely to be of very significant value to you. Um, at this stage, if you are interested in providing a letter of support, if you think you're able to do so, then please just drop me an email at the moment, just, just, just put in the subject line letter of support and in due course I will send you an example letter of support and, uh, and, and ask you to produce one, that'll be re really good. Without those, we're, we're not going to be successful, right? it'll severely hinder what we can do going forward. 
Okay, let's move on to the science of the model. Now, there are three steps in the process of generating a relaxation rate. Two are difficult, and this is the first difficult step, which is to determine what's called a dipolar time-dependent correlation function, normally given the, uh, the symbol capital G of T. This is the only equation I'm going to put in front of you. It looks horrible. It is horrible. But it captures all the science of, uh, of, of the correlation function, which describes how pairs of spins move and interact with each other. There are three key parts to this expression. The first is on the right here, which is the part that describes the dynamics of the spins. This is the part that uh, describes how pairs of spins move relative to each other. There's a little schematic on the right. R naught is the vector connecting a pair of spins at time zero, and R connects the same pair of spins at a later time, T. And this term, capital P, is the probability density that a pair of spins separated by R naught at time zero um, are also separated by R at time T. So that's the dynamics captured by that probability density function. It shows how pairs of spins evolve in space. The second term moving to the left is the part in the square brackets that contains information about the interactions. These are clearly dipolar terms. The y's are the spheric, spherical harmonic functions and um, the R cubes are on the denominator. That's indicative of dipolar interaction. The third part is the geometry of the system. So the spatial integrals are undertaken over the specific volumes that we're talking about, whether that's the surface layer or the bulk region of the fluid, whatever. So there's the ge geometrical part. So those three parts are all put in there. Um, usually some of the integrals are analytical and some are involved in numerical calculation. But actually the toughest part is doing the Fourier transformation, which is the next step. So one takes these correlation functions G of T and execute the Fourier transform to generate these spectral density functions. It's the spectral density functions, the J of omegas, that feed into the software package that then trivially actually generates the relaxation rates at that point. Now, if you've got a couple of liquid environments, you have to do that twice. Um, once for, I've called R1L, the relaxation rate associated with the surface layer and R1B, the relaxation rate associated with the bulk uh, liquid. And those two parts are combined with this X, which is the same X as we saw earlier. X is the fraction of the uh, water at the surface in your system. Now, this equation here at the bottom demonstrates one restriction of the three tower model in that it's only of uh, use in the fast diffusion limit. What the fast diffusion limit means is that your relaxation time, T1, must be longer than, um, sufficiently long, so that there is mixing between the two environments, the layer and the bulk. So we see that time constants in the layer, which are the longer time constants, are typically microseconds. And relaxation times could be as low um, in paramagnetic systems as about a millisecond. So we're always in the fast diffusion regime. It means that the, the water is made several exchanges between the surface and the bulk 
in the time of the experiment. If you like. Okay, so that's that for the maths. Let's have a closer look at the three towels, the three time constants here. So we have uh, water molecules in the bulk and some water molecules in the surface. All are moving. Here's a, 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 a proton spin on a water molecule moving and diffusing around. That diffusion is described by this tau B, the bulk diffusion time constant. It's directly related to D, the diffusion coefficient of the water, that many of you will know is about 2.3 times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second for pure water at room temperature. Delta is the same delta as seen earlier. It's 0.27 nanometers, our standard unit of length, which means that tau bulk, tau B, is the time it takes a water molecule to move a distance of 0.27 nanometers in three dimensional space. That tau B equivalent to the 2.3 times 10 to the minus nine diffusion coefficient comes out at 5.3 picoseconds. So if you can think in terms of picoseconds, pico, uh, 5.3 picoseconds is the time it, it, it takes for a water molecule to move to a position of a neighboring water molecule. Like. The surface diffusion is defined in the same way. So our tau L for layer is defined in exactly the same way. So tau L represents the diffusion coefficient um, of the water at the surface. Obviously that's a lot slower and uh, we'll see later tau L is the order of microseconds. The final time constant is the desorption time constant. That is defined as an exponential. So if we start off with n water molecules in the surface layer at time zero, those water molecules leave in a manner described by e to the minus t over tau d. And there's no um, other top layer here. So the 10 nanometers partially comes about because there's no opportunity for the water molecules to bounce off the top uh, surface and come back, provided the pore size is 10 nanometers or more. So that's tau d, the um, desorption time constant, defined like so. So if we now look at some numbers and look at the fluid dynamics in a little bit more detail, I've reproduced our system here. Again, the black is the solid, of course. The first fluid layer is dark blue, as before. But I've added here a second fluid layer. And I do that to explain to you why we get certain values of tau b coming out of the fits that we do to the various dispersion uh, data. So if we just had pure bulk water at um, room temperature, we would expect to see a tau B of the order of 5.3 picoseconds. However, we know uh, from molecular dynamic simulations, not by us, but by many other people as well, that the second layer of water above the solid, so the, the first layer is at the surface, then there's a second fluid layer. If we look at the dynamics of the water in that second fluid layer, it is much closer in terms of uh, time constant to the bulk than it is to the surface, but it's still a little bit slower than the 5.3 picoseconds, typically 10 to 15 picoseconds. So two to three times slower in that layer. And that's reflected, you see, in the values of tau B that come out of the fits that we do. They do tend to be longer than 5.3 picoseconds because this second fluid layer is the bulk uh, layer closest to the solid where the paramagnetic ions are in this particular case, you see? 
Add into that the possibility that you've got dissolved ions in the water as well, which will slow down the diffusion coefficient a bit. Um, what we end up is with values typically in the range 10 to 15 picoseconds from the FIPS that we do. Tau L is consistently um, of the order of microseconds. An exception to that is if we have organic liquids, which are more slippery on the surface. Uh, methanol, for example, we think is about 0.1 microseconds and perhaps even less than that. Um, but that's, that's normally what we see. Tau D, the desorption time constant, is of the same order as tau L. We always see these two about the same value, similar values. And that's exactly what one would expect. If you think about what's happening in that first fluid layer, how is a water molecule going to escape from the surface? Well, these molecules are jiggling around, they're moving around. And then from time to time, one will try to make a move upwards and away from that first uh, fluid layer. And it has a number of options then. There might be a vacancy in a neighbouring site uh, to jump into at the surface. It might switch around with another water molecule um, at the surface, or it might make a bid for freedom and break out into the bulk. So both desorption and surface diffusion, do you see, are all associated with the same type of process. And it's therefore uh, understandable that these values would be quite similar. There is uh, one other parameter I want to uh, focus on. Remember that X uh, is the fraction of the water at the surface. And X is an annoying number because it's, you know, uh, a small number and it's difficult to get your head around what it actually means. So we convert that into what we call a planar pore equivalent thickness. It's some kind of measure of the pore size of your system. So here we have now a proper pore with a solid surface top and bottom and a surface layer in, in blue uh, attached to that solid and bulk water in between. Um, we have our thickness of the surface layer, always delta, always 0.27 nanometers. And we have H, which is the total thickness of the solid to solid. So X is our surface water fraction and it's quite obvious from uh, this particular image that uh, X is equal to two deltas divided by H. So we use that to, to, to convert X to H which is normally a value of the order of uh, mi microns or submicrons in porous materials and it gives some kind of measure of the uh, thickness of the pore, the equivalent thickness of the pore. Now that's quite useful, not necessarily because its absolute value is relevant, um, but it's certainly um, useful in, in certain circumstances. For example, if you've got setting cement, then the pore size is becoming smaller and smaller. And one would expect to see that in changes in H if one works through a sequence of um, dispersion curves at different times after the water is added to the uh, cement material. So one can assess the impact of um, various um, uh, sort of changes to your system through H on occasions. Okay, moving on. This is, um, don't, don't try and you know, look at the details of this. This is just a, a precursor of what we'll go through in a week's time. So this is the uh, interface. And I'm not uh, here to spend any time going through it. We'll spend plenty of time very informally doing that next week, okay? Um, but what it does show is one example of a fit, which is on plaster paste. And I put this here because I want to emphasize the importance of um, understanding the science of what we're doing when we're attempting to fit to a dispersion curve. There's a real temptation just to um, just try and get the minimum value of chi squared, which is 
right bottom left corner is where it sits um, without necessarily um, uh, giving sufficient attention to, to, to what we're actually doing and the numbers that are coming out. The only number I want I, the only number I want to um, uh, emphasize here is this one. Within the three tower model, we now allow for offsets. Offsets are frequency independent constant value associated with some kind of physical process. There's two buttons here to add an offset. The lower one with the red circle around it is the intramolecular contribution to the water dispersion. Now, with this plaster data, the rates are very low. The water water dispersion um, contributes to the constant frequency independent offset. The value of tau b, the bulk diffusion time constant that comes out of the fit, is only associated with the change in translational motion. This value of 0 0.182 is a number I've come used to putting in now always with these sorts of systems where it, it, it makes a difference um, as the intramolecular contribution. Now, if I put zero in there instead of 0 0.182, I get uh, a better fit actually, but it's the physics that's important here. And so I add that in. So what's that about? Right. So this is the first example of an offset, and this is uh, only really applicable for systems without paramagnetic ions. If there are paramagnetic ions there, that, that swamps everything. So here we have again our solid uh, surface layer bulk liquid system. And um, if we're looking at the translational diffusion uh, time constant tau beta, we're looking at pairs of spins, each of which are moving, uh, according to the normal diffusion dynamics, they're interacting with each other. And we'll get a diffusion coefficient and we're able to work out the relative change in distance. And that feeds into the value of tau b. What it doesn't include is the contribution due to the rotation of the water molecule due to the interaction between uh, pairs of spins in the same molecule, the intramolecular contribution. So that's described schematically here on the left. So the arrow, the vector connecting these two spins of the H2O changes in direction, but not in length. And long time ago, back in the 1950s, I guess, Abragam and uh, I believe others um, determined uh, that, roughly speaking, these contributions should be about equal 50% each, something like that. So, um, so it's important to include that because that's not captured by tau b. We've done some work, and indeed others have, trying to get a fix a better value for that intramolecular contribution. And we, by various means, um, have determined or estimated that it's about 65% of the total contribution to the bulk bulk relaxation rate is associated with the intramolecular motion and um, the remainder due to the translational motion captured by tau b. I put that in, its only effect on the fit actually is to reduce the value of tau b um, actually towards a, um, a closer to the 5.3 picoseconds. Okay, go back to exactly the same interface that I've just shown, the 0.182 is still there. Um, I said that if I put zero, I get a, a better fit actually, because there's these data points on the right hand side here um, tail off somewhat after about 10 megahertz. Now that's easy uh, to ignore really, um, and one would probably just save that and move on. Um, but I think 
And we think that that actually that drop off is associated with the physical process and is associated with the relaxation associated with dissolved oxygen, O2, in the water. It's not normal to deoxygenate water you put into, um, uh, into your system. And it is well known that there is a tail off uh, of um, oxygenated water at that frequency and of a back value. There's all sorts of sources of, uh, uh, of data. I've grabbed this from um, one of Jordan Ward Williams papers and, and co-authors because I, I think it's, it's quite nice and I knew where it was, um, which shows just that really nicely. So the, there's a whole set of dispersion data here um, for a, a range of different liquids. I, I put the arrow pointing to the green diamond, which is the water, and you can see the dispersion is very flat up until just before uh, 10 megahertz, and then it tails off uh, to the right at higher frequencies. Well, this tail off is very similar in magnitude to what we've just seen in the um, plaster paste. So what I'm saying is I think we're good enough for some data sets to identify physical processes uh, that are taking place. And of course, this then provides the opportunity to um, use this as part of the uh, fitting process going forward. If one is always using oxygenated water, then one can have a standard um, uh, sort of function that describes this uh, dioxygen uh, dispersion curve as part of an offset that one can subtract. Another good example of this very thing is in a completely different system. This is a mortar. Again, it's a, a data from um, uh, one of uh, Jean-Pierre Corb's articles from uh, some years ago, much more scatty data, but look at the magnitude of the relaxation rates, goes up to about, they're in hundreds. Um, the offset that provides a, a, a the best fit thereabouts is about 30, seconds to the minus one and that so anything associated with you know dioxygen or um, uh, intramolecular contributions is negligible on that scale now we know what that's due to too that's due to aqueous iron three plus that was a mortar we've done as you know a lot of work with cementitious material and we're able um or some researchers have taken out the pore fluid from a, a hydrated cement material and determined that yes, it has iron three plus ions in it at about the right concentration. Here is an iron three plus dispersion curve uh, undertaken by us as part of the, the Erica project. Thanks to Dermot Brewer and his team at, at Dublin for that and one of our students, uh, Shystock as well. Um, this is the sort of thing we get, but there's plenty of similar data in the literature. That's not my point. My point is that one could, as an adaptation to what we currently do, say, OK, let's use this function given by the black line here as a basis to subtract out the background associated with the dispersion due to aqueous iron 3 plus, because we know we've got iron 3 plus at a particular concentration in that poor liquid. So, and we can even say what the concentration is on the basis of this, uh, it would be about six millimoles. So this dispersion curve is a relaxivity, it uh, corresponds to one millimole of iron three plus. Okay, so that, that's something I just um, sort of highlight as one of the adaption, ad, uh, adapted features that we could include um, in the future versions of the software. Right, that's all I have to say. I want to just finish here again by just reminding you that um, if we are going to be able to expand the scope of this model to the bio and nano areas, if we're going to be able to um, provide bespoke adaptations, and to get you using the software and to help you out, 
we're going to need um, grant support and to achieve that we are going to need letters of support. Remy is uh, doing this unpaid at the moment and we, we need to, to get him paid. Um, so I'd be grateful if you felt so inclined um, to just again drop an email, just put letters of support in the... Um, Sorry I missed that. And, <laughs> And um, and he and help us out. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>